All right, well, this is Joey Svensson, and you are listening to the Pastor with No Answers. And I don't know if you guys, in what you envision when you listen to this podcast, but I am in a guest room of our house, and my oldest daughter is sprawled out on the floor watching some YouTube videos. I'm guessing on how to make slime, because she's a slime expert, and I hear a lot of her peers are into that thing, too. So it is nothing glorified. I don't have any carpets on the walls to help with the, the sound or anything like that. It's just old school DIY sort of thing. So wanted to let you guys know what well, we are joined today with an author, Brian Jennings, who I believe looking at some of his book and what he set out to do in his book, it's called Dancing in No Man's Land, Moving with Peace and Truth in a Hostile World. It could not be a more pertinent time to talk about what you are talking about, Brian, with, you know, our political climate, the LGBTQ community and how the the church is, is polarized on that. And just it's almost like we forget to have we forget um, what it how we approach arguing or debating or we forget how to have conversations for crying out loud without demonizing the other person. Yeah. Am I speaking your language right now. <laughs> yeah, you, you really are. And uh, yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me. Second, yeah, man. there's about a one in 10 chance. My youngest daughter is making slime in the kitchen as we speak. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're into that too. So, uh, and it's just trying to keep it off the carpet the rest of the time. That's the challenge. That is right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Sir. yeah. You're, you're right on it. It just feels like this topic, uh, is striking a nerve with people because I think most of us sense that we are in trouble with how we're treating each other and how we, we just tend to, um, you know, try to attack anybody who doesn't agree with us. And we're even expected to attack anyone who doesn't agree with us. And so we've gotten ourselves in a, in a bad spot. Yeah, for sure. And I've even noticed, and, and I, I hesitate to even speak this way. So I'll just, I'll just throw this out there that, I have not figured this out. Um, I am I am not above reproach. I don't do things the right way, so I don't want to come across as I've got all the answers and I know how to be nice and political and all that. But I will say that one thing that I've been observing is even so. So we'll uh, we'll narrow the field here, even within like progressive Christian podcasts that are out there. A lot of them that I like a whole lot. It's like there's this progressive mindset and this tolerance and there it's almost like they're teaching Christians how to be more loving and accepting but out of the same mouth they are the meanest uh most insulting vocal abrasive people on social media about who they would see as fundamentalists or Trump supporters or Republicans or or whatever and I even want to be careful not to demonize those guys because I, I almost wonder, maybe there are people that are supposed to be super vocal and abrasive. Like maybe they're supposed to be people that turn over tables and temples. I mean, yeah. do you yeah, think there's almost, a place for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like... mean, you know, because I'm so laid back and, and if if... If you know, sometimes that you can get me riled up, but a lot of times when I'm talking about injustice, maybe I lean a little more towards understanding where people are coming from, and that doesn't mean make excuses. That doesn't mean f- not fight, but I can almost maybe lean a little. I can posture myself a little more laid back than maybe I should be. So, are there people and that are supposed to be the opposite extreme? Well, I. I- I guess I would like to think that maybe there's a river we can all swim in and there's some banks somewhere. And um, maybe if one edge of the banks was sometimes maybe speaking a little too much, but then quickly saying, I I, I didn't mean to offend you. I didn't mean, I, I don't hate you. I love you. And then on the other, if just the extreme of that river is sometimes needing to get a little more riled up, then I think yeah. we can be, we can get along and we can talk to each other. But the problem is the extreme, you know, versions would be of if you don't believe this, then I hate you, uh, or I'm going to stand right. for truth. And my, 
and what that looks like is trampling on anyone who doesn't stand with me. And and you're right that kind of that tolerant word comes up and I actually kind of think it's a weak word because if is if all you do is tolerate me, <laughs> then yeah. I'm going to have a terrible life. I would yeah, rather somebody really actually love me. And I think with tolerance is just like, well, we'll put up with you. And if that's the ideal of our society, it's a pretty broken society. I think what Jesus calls us to do is love each other, which is way more difficult to do. It's actually listening to people and um, and trying to help them and maybe even help correct their course if, they're, if they've gone astray because we still care for truth yeah. uh, and, and at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I like that as far as tolerating not being strong enough. I never thought about it that way. You know, and I, I think I want to, I guess you know, restate my, my statement earlier. So what I mean by having, I guess, a a more laid back posture with, with injustice, that, that sounds a little backwards, but what I mean by that is I want people to have more patience and understanding towards the 14 year old black male in public schools that just thinks that maybe his teacher is a racist because he's white because of the stories that he heard about great grandpa and what white people did to his great grandfather and the bitterness that his grandfather had when he, and and just the stuff that he was taught and like valuing his family background upbringing and all of that. And I think that that is probably easier to ingest than the second example, which I think is equally important, and that's the 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 white kid that is just like, gosh, you know, this kind of doesn't make sense, this inequality, but everything he's ever heard in his household was very racially charged, um, you know, black people this and black people that, and all this negativity towards other races. It's like, can we take a step back and realize that everybody has a background, everybody was spoon fed something, everybody grew up with certain parents. And it's just like, if if we can't, and and that's what I like what you're after is if we can't figure out how to have conversations with people that are indeed lost or they have things messed up, how are we supposed to help our brother and sister out for crying out loud? Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I can't even remember some of the examples in the last month, but there was a couple of times where somebody quickly yelled racist and it turned out that wasn't the case it was an overreaction and that overreaction actually hurts the cause that we're after it actually it actually drives people farther apart because then when i'm saying hey we need to talk about um prejudice we need to talk about some of the systematic issues i just get written off because they point to that person who who made an extreme example and so we've done quite a bit of stuff in our church and in our community and uh, had um, try to have lots of conversations. But one of the things I almost always remind people of is how much grace God had with Peter because right. Peter kept blowing it and he just could not get it that Gentiles would be accepted. And it was like God had to keep going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, Peter didn't get it here. So I'm going to try this, a vision. And uh, okay, Peter kind of messed up here. I'm going to have to send Paul to rebuke him. And I'm, I'm reminded that Peter, even as one of the pillars of the early church that he was, still it took him time to understand what God was trying to communicate. And so if it took Peter a long time, it might take me a long time and you a long time and lots of people a long time. And I want to hold out grace for those people. So yeah. that means I don't want to just uh, start uh, writing them off and dismissing them and saying they're never going to get it. I want to have some patience with people, even if they're not where they need to be quite yet. Yeah, for sure. And I think what may happen, I think where that gets lost, because I totally agree with you. And I think where that gets lost is it's like when people get caught up in, yeah, but you know, there's real people involved. And if this person isn't thinking right, that affects people. And so I've got to speak out loudly, but it's almost like you're those those sorts of folks are looking for band-aid solutions to issues that are going to have to correct themselves over time like you know if if someone is in a place where they are going to um 
you know, treat someone unfairly because of their gender or their race or sexual orientation or whatever, do you really think you saying something very assertive and poignant at, you know, and, and just super convincing words is going to just change them right there on the spot? You know, I mean, it just seems like these sorts of things are are going to take time. That's a really, that's a, that's a good point as far as Peter's concerned. And I would imagine too, that if you expand that narrative a little bit and, and you know, the, it, we obviously are just seeing the tip of the iceberg with how Peter was interacting with Gentiles. I guarantee you there were m- more examples of probably some things where people would have come across Peter and been like, dude, you're being an asshole. Like, you are ridiculous right now. Like, uh, who do you think you are talking to a Gentile that way or looking at a Gentile that way or treating them in this sort of way or showing favoritism to, you know, your your Jewish brother? And yeah, I, I would imagine there's way more examples of that than what we're seeing in the Bible. Yeah, we had a um, panel discussion that our church hosted um, a little bit after the uh, Terrence Crutcher shooting, which happened in Tulsa, which made headlines. And yeah, um, and we were nervous uh, in the city, but we had this panel discussion. And one of the really cool things that came out of that was for people who came in there a little bit nervous about what was going to be said to yeah. leave going like, oh, that person who has a totally different background and culture than me, whether that be uh uh, an African American preacher friend of mine. Um, uh, we had a friend of mine who's a white police officer, and then we had all kinds of other people uh, on the stage. But for them to leave saying, "Oh, like what they're saying is kind of what I've been thinking," or maybe it challenges me a little bit, but they're not like going crazy saying these extremist things. And what we realize is, uh, you know, in what happened in Tulsa. The only people who got interviewed on the news were the people that had the really extreme positions who yeah. would either idolize or demonize, you know, either the police officer or Mr. Crutcher. And it was like you had to pick one of those two things. But a whole right. lot of people were saying, no, 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 we don't have to rush and demonize one and idolize the other. There's actually a little bit more nuanced position here that we can try to find. But those people never get a microphone put in their face. Right. Oh yeah, man. You gotta, you gotta pick your side for sure. You got, <laughs> you gotta know exactly where you stand, who you support. You gotta make it clear. If you don't speak out, then you're, you're against. I mean, it's just so many, so many rules and all that stuff. You know, I, um, reading, a a blip from, you know, I don't know if it's an actual excerpt from the book, but the, the promo for it. So what I want to do is I want to encourage our listeners to think of something that you are extremely convinced of and not only convinced of, but it really means something is super important. It's maybe a justice issue, uh, uh, equality. So just think of something that gets you riled up. And then I'm going to read this little blip here. It says, we're not good at living with tension. It's uncomfortable. It feels unsafe. The moment a friend, spouse, business, or political movement disagrees with us, we flee to the safety of like-minded thinkers and dehumanize and attack anyone who thinks differently. No one wins. And if someone dares question our particular stance, we demonize them. This is killing us, families, friendships, uh, civility, and discourse. It ruins our chance to hear and be heard. So I agree with that, but walk people through how that looks when we're talking super serious stuff like uh, treating the LGBTQ community unfairly, seeing them as less than human. It's really easy to see why people would not be riled up about that. So take that excerpt that I just read and apply that to, you know, some super sensitive issues that people have a right to be upset about. Yeah. So if I can do that second and first, maybe just lay out the metaphor a little bit. Yes. Um, In World War I, um, you had the Germans and the French fighting and the Germans literally dug straight down into the earth. And then the French did the same thing, and trench warfare just ended up crisscrossing all of Europe. And it stalemated the war. They might only be 50 yards apart, but neither army could advance. And in the trench, in those bunkers, 
you know, there, it was mud and rats and disease and sometimes dead bodies, and it was the worst of conditions, and you only knew what your commanding officers or peers told you. You didn't know anything right. about the outside world. Uh, and if you dared to peek at the other side, you would get shot. And so the area between the trenches and bunkers was called no man's land. And that's the place where you feel like you're going to get shot from both sides. So with that kind of metaphor, when um, when the Chick-fil-A fiasco happened, and you yeah. know you know our world is a mess when we start killing each other you know, over a chicken nugget, but it happened. Yeah, catch, it, uh, you know. catch us up to speed. Remind yeah. us of that. So um, several um, uh, groups, uh, several gay rights activist groups uh, began a boycott of Chick-fil-A based on how they were spending their some of their charity giving and right. uh, with some groups that they felt like under undermined them. And so when they did that, there was, of course, the boycotts, and then kind of from the religious right, there was a push back, and you certainly saw it on social media that was hitting those groups that were boycotting, and then you had actual stuff taking place in the stores to try to disrupt business, and the whole country seemed to be fighting about this thing. Um, so if you could look at the metaphor, you could see two groups that had clearly run for their bunkers. And they hated you if you weren't in their bunker. And they wouldn't really be okay with you standing in this no man's land in between. But I, I tell a story yeah. in the book of um, Dan Cathy, uh, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, um, who actually initiated a conversation with uh, Shane Winmeyer. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Forgive me if I'm not. But who was yeah. one of the ones leading the boycott and a, a major voice for these opposition groups. And um, Winmeyer actually wrote an article, I think, in the Huffington Post about this and said that, you know, Dan Cathy called him and they just began this conversation. And he was super nervous. He thought it was a setup job of some type. But Cathy just said, I just want to get to know you and to talk so I can understand right. you. And so they both cautiously entered into um, these conversations with each other uh, that turned into a friendship. And they, they did not either one change all of their beliefs uh, chick-fil-a did change some of the some of uh, who they were giving money to um, but they didn't have a radical shift away from everything they believed but the two yeah. of them learned to actually respect each other and when they did that both of them caught heat for it especially when my he really yeah. got written <laughs> off uh, by by being a, a turncoat or traitor uh because he had the audacity to be willing to speak to someone who did not agree with him. And so I felt bad for him taking all of that. And I'm sure that Kathy caught some of the same stuff. I don't know if it was quite as public, um, but that's, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about where we go to no man's lane. It feels really dangerous because we're, we're saying I'm not going to get in a bunker and turn my gun on someone else, even if I disagree with them. Yeah. Because if, if you, if you're in no man's land for, for one set of people in one bunker you're being way too tolerant to the other side that you know brings injustice or is not understanding enough and then for them too you're you're not on board enough it's like you're you don't have as as enough vigor with something that's super important and that is unbelievable what you just said is that these people were uh demonized for putting a person first like basically those two set out to say you know what i'm gonna get to know the person i'm gonna mm -hmm. try to get to know you know their background and get to know their life story and maybe figure out why they think the way that they think and that was wrong <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i mean that's just insane and it is i mean i'm glad you wrote a whole book on this because it this is really important that we figure it out. And I, I'll be honest, I think I'm more of a, you know, I was big into the late nineties emo scene and struggled with depression and all that stuff. I, I'm, I'm a pessimist with this sort of thing. I just, mm -hmm. I don't see it getting any better. And I know that is a horrible thing, but how I've got a lot of questions in between, uh, you know, this question that I'm going to ask and a lot of the stuff I've already asked. So we'll probably circle back around, but what is the solution to this? Like, if someone reads your book, do they come a, do they come away with an analysis of the current problem 
and just kind of probes people's minds to think about it? Or do you have some uh, act? action steps that people can read and be like, okay, yeah, I need to start doing things differently. Yeah. What I try to do is just kind of lay out of a self analysis, um, kind of, you might be in a bunker if kind of a a deal is part one of just kind of analyzing that. And the second part of the book, which is kind of the bread and butter of the book is just these principles, uh, these biblical characteristics that sometimes we think are opposites and how, Jesus actually lived them together. So things such as grace and truth or wisdom and tact or gentleness and strength um, or humility and courage. We would think humility and courage are opposites. You know, if you're, if you're humble, uh, you're not all that brave. Or if you're super courageous, then you're full of yourself. And Jesus actually kind of puts these things together time and time and time again. Uh, and I, th- I think it's this commitment to not drop either one. And then on the uh, the third part of the book, I just walk through. Do you have any examples of Jesus topics. doing that, by the way? Yeah. So um, one of my favorite examples is it because it, it's such a classic bunker setup is when Jesus with his disciples and the religious people come and it's a trap. The text says it's, it was a trick, and they said, "Should we pay taxes or not?" And that that was a bunker question because if he said yes, you should pay taxes that would be an admission that Caesar is God because Caesar was claiming to be God and it would be seen as you've exalted Caesar to this place of divinity, which he is after his pictures on the coins. And so that's what they were trying to trick him. And if he said, no, you should not pay your taxes, then that would be saying, well, you're rebelling against the government. And, and so they would trick him that way. So it was, it was like a perfect bunker question. And it's one that if, Somebody would have asked me, I probably would have fallen into one bunker or the other. But Jesus had the wisdom to say, you know, not to not answer it straight up, but to ask a question first, whose picture is on the coin, he says. And they look at it and they say, well, Caesar's picture is on it. And he says, okay, well, we'll give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. So in yeah. other words, he, he stays out of the bunkers by saying, you know, pay your taxes, give it back to Caesar. That's fine. He made the coin. He can have it back, but don't give him beyond your coin. Don't give him your worship. And so Jesus always was masterful at living in this no man's land where people would leave him not fully content because he hadn't no one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No one gets away unscathed. And that's, that's hard. I mean, that really, the no man's land that you're talking about, it really is hard because you're not satisfying anybody. Everybody's upset with you. Yeah, but the beautiful thing is they're probably not so upset with him that they couldn't maybe have a conversation with him later. They at least know he didn't take the other side that was trying to destroy them. And with the religious leaders here, you know, there was nothing Jesus could probably do for most of them to yeah. to make them content because they were after him. But uh, yeah, it, it, ultimately he left himself the possibility to have friendships and to have influence in their lives later. Uh, because he hadn't called them the enemy that he was going to, you know, work against the rest of his life. Yeah. I mean, so, so let's, let's think of friendships then. Is it possible, you know, obviously I think that, um, oh, it, it's interesting. It's like the movie Taken. You've got the guy in France that used to be a friend of Liam Neeson, and he, he really does have, a personal family life where he's a decent dad. He reads some bedtime stories. Uh, he, he seems to be wanting to take care of his wife, but in his occupational world, he turns a blind eye to some really messed up stuff, which everyone can point at that and say, yeah, that's really messed up. I'd even say that's evil that he's turning a blind eye to that. But I don't think that that completely discredits the sincerity of his love for his kids. I mean, it's almost just like, so there's, there's evilness in his heart, but there's also the, there's also some room for some good, you know, personal stuff going on. And so that begs the question to me, like, and I'm notorious for going extreme. So let's, let's go super extreme. If you were, if you happen to, and I don't even know if this scenario would have existed, but if you were, uh, new to, 
the 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 Germany area, <laughs> and you moved to Germany back in the day, and you, you strike up a conversation with a guy at a coffee shop, and hey, you know, my name's Joey, and he's like, my name's Adolf, and you you build up a, a a friendship, a relationship. Maybe you find some some common ground with some hobbies. Next thing you know, you're fishing together, and then you realize, holy cow, I am blind as a bat here. I have haven't even realized who this guy is do you have to stop being a friend to someone who is doing such atrocious stuff or is there any value in that friendship or is that just the most ridiculous question you've ever heard in your life (laughs) well i'm thinking i'm thinking a movie called fishing with hitler would be fantastic um (laughs) uh, or a book there um but no i i think that the problem becomes for many of us, whether it's a friendship or even a political figure. Yeah. If, if we align ourselves to them in such a way that we blind ourselves from reality, that's where the problem is. And right. So I think if, if I, if I have a friend uh, and I realize, man, they are actually damaging people. Um, and I can remember a conversation I had with a, with a guy, um, one time where, you know, and I hate confrontation. So I had to, you know, take a walk and say a prayer and calm my nerves, but said, man, what you're doing to your wife and kids is just not okay. Like yeah. this, this is going to be really bad for them and for you. And, you know, he didn't take that very well. And, you know, he didn't, he went in a fight, but, um, he kind of dismissed it and was frustrated with me. But I, I had to put what was right and good above even our friendship, but yeah. I still tried to be, I still tried to be a friend. I, I didn't want to just say, I'm mad at you. You're I'm, I'm done with you. I never want to talk to you again, but, but to be able to say, Hey, you know that we, you know, I care about you. We have lunch, we've hung out, but, but this has to change and, and to try to at least extend friendship to him. And at that point, it's kind of on him. Yeah, uh, but I'm not going to be the one who runs away from him. Maybe yeah. if it's Hitler, you know, I'm I might have to pull a Bonhoeffer. Um, and, yeah, well, and, I mean, you so, know, but so that's take, pretty tricky there. Yeah, let, so let's take that e- example though. I, I like what you said, and so let's let's bring it back to Hitler. What <laughs> it sounds so bizarre, but wouldn't it make sense to say, you know what, man, I know what you're doing. And I cannot support this, and I can't even stomach to hang out with you. But I want you to know that I love you, man. Like, we have been friends. We've developed a relationship outside of all this. And I'll even put it this way, man. If you ever get in a bind that's not related to this deplorable stuff that you're doing, but, you know, a a kid gets sick or something, I want you to feel like you can call on me as a friend that's committed to you, but I'm not hanging out with you, man. Like I, th- I've, I've told you that this is uh, unbelievably horrid stuff that you're doing. I, my mind can't even comprehend the depths of pain that you're causing to so many people. I cannot hang out with you and pretend like this is not happening, but I love you. I mean, it seems like that may be what Jesus was getting at when when he says to love your enemies, and I sound so arrogant and full of pride right now. I know how I'm coming across. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it just seems like there's got to be there's got to be something to that. Like like, for example, the Christians, and um, you know, my wife has been on this show a good bit, and she would admit this and and she sees this as a huge blunder on her part. But when Osama bin Laden was found, uh, and, and shot and done away with, she went on Facebook and was like, praise the Lord. Now she is such a different person from that time, but even that person back in the day, she wasn't celebrating the death of someone, even though it did come across that way. She was celebrating justice. Wow. Right. Right. You know, our, our country has gone through so much pain and now that there is some closure, this is something to celebrate, but it still came across as that life is less important because it's so full of evil. And I think as Christians, we've got to be the ones that figure out 
okay, it's still a life. And he didn't get that way on accident. He didn't just all, he wasn't born. And then when he was two, he said, I want to kill thousands of Americans. But I mean, it, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. It really is tricky. Yeah. I got to interview Dr. John Perkins in my book and that's one of my favorite parts of it. But for those who, who don't know his story, um, he was, uh, uh, grabbed by police officers illegally, taken to a jail and beaten because he was leading a boycott um, in Mendehall. Yeah. And uh, he's beat to within an inch of his life. In fact, his friends thought he was dead. Um, he had committed no crime. And he, he told me, he said, when I was laying there on that floor, you know, bleeding, thinking I was going to die, if I would have had a grenade, I would have pulled the pin and dropped it and blown us all to smithereens. Wow. And he said in that he said in that moment, God convicted me that uh, the police officers were victims as I was a victim because I hated them as much as they hated me, and whoever is hated is a victim. Wow. And and he said God taught me that in that moment I needed to love my enemies or or they were victims too, and so. Galatians 2.20, for I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but he lives in me, is the theme verse kind of for Perkins. And he just talks about the need to die to self. And of course, most of the times he was dying to self. Um, it wasn't that extreme of a place, but that's where it started. Right. And you know, throughout his life, he faced all types of opposition, whether it be physical um, or political or um uh, what have you from from all kinds of directions from those who thought he should be more harsh uh, with his oppressor oppressors and the, and those who were his oppressors and, and all of that and so uh, just that continual dying to self means I put other people above myself and try to figure out how to love them even when it's even when it's pretty messy to try to figure out how to do that yeah 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 and and you know as as silly as I think that I have uh, sounded in this conversation, especially, you know, somewhat arrogant, because I know daggum well that if someone did something to one of my kids, it's way easier said than than done to carry out that sort of love. But I think thinking back on on some of the stuff that we've discussed, I'm I'm comfortable with that being our aim because of Christ's example at the very least, let's say, Hey, I'm trying, I'm trying to aim for that. And he said, father, forgive them for they know not what they've done. I mean, and that was at least in Jesus's world, that was, they are killing me for no reason. Like I am not guilty. I have, in fact, I actually came, you know, to solve all this mess and yet they're destroying me. And that's how, you know, so that was a huge injustice. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand by that. So let me ask you this. Do yeah. you, do you think that this can get better? You know, cause like I said, I'm pretty pessimistic. I, I I'm, I'm doubtful. It just seems like we're on a roller coaster ride to getting worse and worse and worse. And I mean, I hesitate to think about where this is going to take us, but do you have some positivity in you as far as turning this thing around? Yeah, when I, I started writing this book five and a half years ago, and which means I'm a really slow writer, but I've also... Did you say seven and a half years ago? Five and a half years. Five and a half, gotcha. Yeah, and, and there were times where I thought, you know, maybe things will get better, or maybe Andy Stanley will write a book about it, and my book won't matter anyway. Right. Um, but very little has been said quite kind of the way that I'm trying to say it, I guess. Yeah. I, I feel like it's been bubbling underneath the surface, but we haven't quite put a finger on it. But if I didn't have a little bit of optimism, I, I think I would have cashed it in and done something different. I don't know um, if we can shift the whole culture, but the good thing is that I've been going through a study of the book with um, about 50 people um, just kind of privately, yeah. And what I, the early returns are that some a lot of people are saying, "Boy, this has really challenged me." And I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm seeing how Jesus lived this way, and how I'm bunkered up here or here or here. And so, what what I've seen it do is 
uh, I think God has changed my heart in this, and he certainly has changing some other hearts, albeit on a small scale right now. But I do think that if the metaphor is helpful, because yeah. now when a story breaks, I just picture World War One and two bunkers, and I try to figure out where everybody's going to run, and then I turn on the news and I watch it happen, or I, yeah. or I see it happen at you know uh, at a at a dinner table with friends or whatever it might be. You can just see it happen when a something gets brought up of somebody saying, "What do you think of Trump?" or "What about immigration?" or "What do you think about?" Um, John dating this new girl. I mean, there can be all kinds of questions, whether it be on a big political or just a small family scale, and yeah. you can just see people. And so the metaphor, I think, is really helpful to people. Yeah. And then to begin digging into scriptures, I do have some optimism, but I think if it's going to happen, it's going to be the church leading the way here, because ultimately, I believe it's only God that can change our hearts. And so if God can use this book as a resource, to help people, then yeah. that's that's been my prayer, is that he'll use it. And I think that God's speaking to some other people. I think my book is a small part of what he wants to do, because as I've been talking to people around the country, um, they just really are resonating with this and saying, yeah, 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 what's in this book is kind of what I've been trying to figure out, or I just haven't put it into words yet, and this is really helpful. And so I'm hopeful that this book can be a small piece in what God's trying to do to, to help us to see the world and live a little bit differently, even if it starts on a really small scale. I don't know yeah. if we can change the whole political culture, um, but I think the church, we can at least do our job. And if we get out of our bunkers, then it's going to make it a lot more likely that some other people will too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. If it's going to start with the church, it, it, I think it'll be a, a remnant. Cause I, I look at the church, I'm like, uh, <laughs> It seems like some of the most outrageous, biggest problems is within the church. But I, you know, I want to qualify that by saying it's the religiosity that is within the church that I yeah. feel like I don't want to demonize them either. I want to call that what it is. These are people that were brought up in very prejudiced cultures, very narrow-minded, fundamentalist. You know, this is if you don't agree with me, you're evil sort of thing. Right. But I, I do believe I, you know, I think there's, I think there's remnants, it, you know, within the church and outside of the church, but I agree with you. I think God's got to be behind it all to, to move us uh, to some, to some different areas. Well, this has been awesome, man. I definitely want people to check out your book. What's the best way for them to get it? Is it just Amazon or is, is it better yep. for you if they go to your website or what? No, either way, they can find it on Amazon and uh, they can also go to my website if they want to just read and check it out a little bit more. It's uh, dancinginnomansland.com. All right. And they can find lots of ways you can buy it at different stores that way. And so, yeah, hope hope that they do, and hope that they can spread it around. It's it's a great resource for small groups. A bunch of small groups uh, are going to be going through it um, because it's a, it's just good discussion stuff, like the discussion you and I have had today. Yeah, very cool. Well, thanks for your time, man. And uh, yeah, we'll catch up later. Thanks for having me.